Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public events sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of CG's signature lecture series. Thanks also to those joining us from around the world tonight through our live webcast. Uh, following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences here in the auditorium and uh, through the live chat function on your screen if you're watching at home. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. We have a, a nearly sellout crowd here tonight despite the uh, sub-zero temperatures in Waterloo and an especially large audience online as well, and I'm not surprised. Our speaker, John Ibbotson, is a renowned Canadian journalist with a significant print online and social media following of his own. He's on a one-year leave of absence from his longtime employer, The Globe and Mail, to write a book for McClellan and Stewart, a biography of Stephen Harper. And during 2014, he's also a senior fellow with CG and in residence here in Waterloo most of the time to conduct policy research for CG on the subject of Canadian foreign policy. In his seven years as Prime Minister, Stephen Harper has been leading and developing a new Canadian foreign policy described in tonight's address as the Harper Do Doctrine. And John will explain just that, what that means for you, for me, for Canada and the world. Over the past 25 years, uh, John has worked as a reporter and a columnist for the Ottawa Citizen, Southern News, the National Post, and since 1999 at Canada's National Newspaper, where I'm proud to say he and I were at one time fellow Globies uh, newsroom colleagues. He's also the author of novels, plays, and authoritative nonfiction books, including most recently, The Big Shift, The Seismic Change in Canadian Politics, Business, and Culture, and What It Means for Our Future a book he co-wrote with Daryl Bricker, and I'm pleased to advise that it's on sale in our lobby tonight for only $28, and its resale value will likely double if you can persuade our speaker to sign it for you. <laughs> uh, we're proud to welcome him to our ranks at, of CG experts and pleased to present him to you here tonight. Uh, please welcome John Ibbotson. Thank you, Fred, and, and thank all of you for uh, coming out on yet another uh, wintry Waterloo evening. Early spring by Ottawa standards. Uh, the talk that I'm going to give tonight is uh, my first thoughts on an idea that I hope to develop further, both here at CG and uh, later in the, in the book that I'm doing on Harper. So, we have till 8.30. I'm going to try to take up no more than half of that. And I'm hoping that you'll come to these microphones, there and there, I believe, um, and, and let's get a dialogue going, um, because uh, your thoughts on this will help to inform and I ensure improve uh, later uh, versions of the same, th of the same, uh, of the same talk. <clears throat> Transitioning from journalism to think tankery has its challenges. Um, one is the inversion of headline and text. CG asked for a title for this talk back in late November, which is perfectly reasonable uh, for a, an address that's to be given in late January. Except, as Fred can tell you, in the newspaper business, the, the story usually gets written before the headline. And of course, uh, preparation time is measured in hours, not weeks. Uh, so I came up with the Harper Doctrine, a conservative foreign policy revolution. Uh, the folks at CG were happy with it, um, and so was I, except for one thing. Having announced that I was going to talk about the Harper Doctrine, um, I had to come up with one. <laughs> and my first thought was that maybe somebody had done this for me, that somebody else had already written and defined a Harper Doctrine. Um, and a database search produced one very early alarming surprise. Someone had written a, Harper, a, a, a piece on the Harper Doctrine. I had, uh, in a September column from 2011 that I had completely forgotten about. Hey, look, 200 columns a year, right? Sometimes you lose track. So I read this column with particular interest. And it was written as the House of Commons was preparing to debate approving Canadian participation in the Libyan mission. And it, uh, it drew uh, from a quote in a speech that Stephen Harper had recently given. He said, we know where our interests lie and who our friends are. And we take strong principled positions in our dealings with other nations, whether popular or not. 
I grandly declared that this was not just Tory boilerplate, that it was, in fact, a new foreign policy doctrine for Canada. I wonder why I thought that. The sentence is bullish, yes, even provocative, but a doctrine? As columns go, I've had better days. A much more interesting definition of a Harper Doctrine came from Eugene Lang in 2012. Uh, Lang was Chief of Staff to Defence Ministers John McCallum and Bill Graham in the Kretsch and Martin years, and he was writing in the National Post. He maintained that the central fact of Canadian foreign policy in our time has been the, the relative economic and military decline of the United States. The Harper government's response, wrote Lang, has been to lend a hand to a struggling America in spots like Afghanistan and Libya, while scrambling to find new markets for Canadian products. This is the Harper Doctrine, he declared. It represents a brave new world for Canada, one in which we gradually unwind our economic dependence on the United States and fully embrace economic globalization while helping our troubled ally put out fires around the world in a way we never have before. It's an interesting take, but for me, it's just a little bit too anti-American. The most persuasive observation on the Harper Doctrine that I came across was written by Eric Morris in the Ottawa Citizen. If you're a small to middle power, he wrote, the less defined your foreign policy doctrine is, the better. After all, the whole purpose of a doctrine is for a great power to alert other great powers of its interests and, int and intentions, and Canada is not a great power. So, there is no Harper Doctrine, and there shouldn't be. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Um, actually, there is something that we should talk about tonight, and it's not a foreign policy doctrine, but it is transformative. I call it the big break. The big break, the biggest in Canadian foreign policy since the Second World War, came in 2006 with the election of the first Harper government. And although it took the Conservatives time to get their footing, they now pursue a foreign policy that is, in many respects, the polar opposite of everything that came before. What was elitist became populist. What was multilateral became bilateral. What was cooperative became assertive. What was foreign affairs became an extension of domestic affairs. What was, you name it, security, governance, conflict resolution, all became trade and not much else. Now, I suspect a great many people in this room who are those who are watching online have an opinion about the big break. There's nothing to be gained from me spouting another one. Instead, what I'd like to do is explain how the break came about, what it looks like, and what it means for our country going forward. And then we'll have at it. When Jean Chrétien became Prime Minister in November 1993, he inherited from Brian Mulroney a set of foreign policy assumptions that Mulroney had inherited from Pierre Trudeau, who inherited his from Lester Pearson, who had helped craft those assumptions when he was external affairs minister to Louis Saint Laurent. I call this Canadian worldview Laurentian. As Fred mentioned, Daryl Bricker and I published a book last year called The Big Shift. I suffer from a poverty of imagination when it comes to titles. Daryl and I argued that from the time of Confederation until very recently, Canada had been governed by the political, bureaucratic, academic, media, cultural, and business elites of the cities along the St. Lawrence watershed, principally Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. On all the great issues of the day, from the national policy to gay marriage, the Laurentian elites debated the issue among themselves, generally they reached a consensus, and then implemented that consensus. They ran the country. But the Laurentian elites were undone by two great demographic shifts that they did not understand and could not control. The shift in population and wealth and political power to the West, and the five million immigrants, two Toronto's worth of immigrants, almost all of them from Asia and the Pacific, who have come here in the past 20 years since the Chrétien government opened the floodgates in the 1990s. The Laurentian elites assumed that the West would always remain a region. Conservative, yes, but never powerful enough to dictate the agenda in Ottawa. They assumed that new Asian arrivals would happily embrace the values, beliefs, and voting habits of their hosts, just as earlier European immigrants had. But the West got bigger faster than they anticipated. The 2011 census 
revealed that there are now more people living in the four western provinces than in Quebec and Atlantic Canada combined. And the Chinese and Filipino and Indian and other immigrants who came to this country over the past two decades are socially and economically more conservative than most of the native born. We know that because of the election day exit polls conducted by Daryl's firm, Ipsos Reid. And as these new arrivals settled and prospered, moving into the vast swaths of suburban cities surrounding Toronto, known as the 905, they did something that the Laurentian elites had never anticipated. They started voting conservative. The big shift then is actually two shifts. The shift in population and power and influence from the center to the west, and the shift in voting patterns by aspirational, aspirational immigrants living in the suburban cities of the 905. Daryl and I believe that this shift is permanent and that it's accelerating. Now, our book discussed mostly foreign affair, domestic affairs, but the foreign policy consequences are every bit as dramatic. To put those consequences into context, I've divided the arc of Canada's foreign policy over the past generation or so into four periods. Laurentian coherence, Laurentian incoherence, conservative incoherence, conservative coherence. Colin Robertson, the former diplomat and current uh, foreign policy analyst, dates Canada's post-war policy assumptions from a speech that Louis Saint Laurent, when he was external affairs minister, delivered at the University of Toronto in 1947. It's important to remember that was two years after the end of the Second World War. I'm grateful to uh, Mr. Robertson for sharing with me a paper he has written in advance of publication that drew my attention to that speech. Thanks again, Colin. Saint Laurent talked of the need for Canada to embrace and advance collective security. In the shadow of the Second World War and facing a new Cold War, he stressed the national interest in promoting alliances with other democracies, promoting the international rule of law, accepting international responsibilities. Our geography, our climate, our natural resources have so conditioned our economy that the continued prosperity and well-being of our own people can best be served by the prosperity and well-being of the whole world, saint Laurent concluded. We have thus a useful part to play in world affairs, useful to ourselves through being useful to others. He stressed as well the need to cooperate with the new American superpower to the south, while always, always being on the watch for the latest annexationist tendencies. And above all, he maintained that foreign policy must promote national unity. French Canada and English Canada had different values and priorities. The wounds of the conscription crisis were still raw in 1947. Quote, no policy can be regarded as wise which divides the people whose efforts and resources must put it into effect, he warned. The role of this country in world affairs will prosper only as we maintain this principle, for a disunited Canada will be a powerless one. Sandoval's lecture series serves as a template for foreign policy as per pursued by the Laurentian consensus, from the founding of NATO, through the Nobel Prize for Peacekeeping, to aid for Africa, to the landmine and criminal court treaties, to responsibility to protect. Canada would project its values to the world, to the extent those values were shared by both French and English, through forums that we helped to create and to sustain. At its best, and Canada was often at its best. This period of what I call Laurentian coherence in foreign policy allowed our country to influence the shape, though never the actual existence, of international organizations, institutions, and treaties. It also instilled in Canadians a certain pride in the respect that the world felt for Canada, and perhaps not only by our allies, but even more by those states that were emerging from colonialism. We were the good guys. But the era of the Laurentian consensus was undermined by external shocks and internal erosion. Internally, national social programs such as public health care, public education, uh, social housing, the Canada Pension Plan, welfare programs were paid for in part by cutting the budget for defense. From a peak of under, and believe it or not, just, eight, uh, uh, just under 8% of GDP in the early 1950s, when Canada was on the front lines of both the Korean War and the Cold War, defense spending fell steadily through the Saint Laurent, Diefenbaker, Pearson, and Trudeau governments, up slightly during the Mulroney years, and then continued its descent under Jean Chrétien, bottoming out at 1% of GDP in 2000. 
A smaller military meant less ability to contribute to peacekeeping and other manifestations of the global security agenda. Canada's ranking among nations that contribute to peacekeeping has fallen from first in 1991 to 61st in 2013. In 1991, there were almost 3,300 Canadians in blue helmets. Last year, 115. A diminished military also meant a diminished Canadian role in NATO. And it led John Manley, who was then a minister in the Chrétien government, to gross that you can't sit at the G8 table and then go to the washroom when the check comes. <laughs> the external shocks were even more severe. The end of the Cold War ended, uh, eroded the stability of a bipolar world, and 9-11 threw everything into chaos. Canada struggled to respond to American rage over the terrorist attacks. The Canada-US border thickened as security concerns trumped economic concerns. The Chrétien government refused to get involved in the war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, but offered to contribute to Afghanistan. And uh, Paul Martin deepened that commitment when he became prime minister. Canada took over responsibility for the troubled Kandahar province. Martin also sought to thaw a chill in Canada-US relations by agreeing to sign on to the Bush ballistic missile defense program. But then he reversed that decision. And when his minority government was threatened with defeat, he began bashing the Americans for failing to meet the challenge of global warming, even though the Chrétien and Martin governments had done absolutely nothing about global warming except study the thing. You can see from all this why I call the period from 2001 to 2006 a period of Laurentian incoherence. Contradiction and contraction in Canada's relations with its allies, even as our country stumbled into a shooting war in Afghanistan. None of it contributed to the liberal defeat in 2006. Scandal was the issue in that election. And it brought a shaky conservative minority government to power that many observers thought would be swept away as soon as the liberals got their house in order. But instead, the conservatives have won victory after victory after victory. It was the big shift and it created the big break in foreign policy. To understand the foundations of the Harper government's foreign policy over the past eight years, you must understand this. The electoral coalition that sustains this government is unique. There has never been anything like it before in Canadian politics. There has never been a majority government in this country without substantial support from Quebec. This is a majority government in which there are as many MPs from the West as there are from Ontario. And those MPs from Ontario divide into about one-third from the rural ridings and two-thirds from the big suburban ridings that surround Toronto and other cities, many of them with majority immigrant populations. And the final third consists of suburban, uh, excuse me, the final tranche consists of mirror ridings in the lower mainland of British Columbia. Rural Ontario, suburban immigrant Ontario, suburban non-immigrant Ontario, rural and prairie voters, rural and suburban British Columbia voters. This is the conservative coalition. The foreign policy of the conservative government reflects the values of that coalition. Look at who is not in this coalition. Almost anyone from Quebec. Almost anyone who lives south of the 401, west of the Don Valley, east of the Humber River in Toronto. Almost anyone who lives in the downtowns of any of the major Ontario cities. Anyone who attends or works at Carleton University, the University of Ottawa, Queen's University, Ryerson University, University of Toronto, York University, University of Guelph, University of Windsor, the Northern Ontario Universities, University of Alberta, University of British Columbia, or University of Victoria. All of those universities are in writings represented by Liberal or NDP MPs. The University of Waterloo and Sir Wilfrid Laurier University are in a conservative writing which I suspect breaks the hearts of many people in this room. It is hugely important to always bear in mind who is in the conservative coalition and who is outside it. In fact, it's fundamental. The Harper government's foreign policy, as well as every other aspect of that government, has been fiercely criticized by the academy for its ideological polarizing agenda. It has few supporters, many critics, and more than a few enemies in the departments representing the humanities and social sciences of almost every university outside Calgary. What these critics fail to take into account is that this government does not govern on their behalf. It governs on behalf of its own coalition, rural and suburban English Canada. 
But shouldn't governments serve all Canadians, you might ask, and not just their voting base? Perhaps they should. But bear this in mind. This Conservative coalition has supported the Harper's government through three elections because he is the first politician and the new Conservative Party is the first political party who represents them, who speaks to their values and their concerns. The Laurentian predecessors didn't, and they paid the price. Now, some critics call this approach to foreign policy populist. I have found over the years that populist is a derogatory term used by the Laurentian consensus to describe anyone who disagrees with them. But it is not unfair to say that the big break represents a shift from an elitist to a populist foreign policy. It would be a mistake, however, to say that the Conservatives came to office with a carefully considered foreign policy tailored to populist values and designed to appeal to the Conservative coalition. It would be a mistake to say that the Conservatives came to office with any foreign policy whatsoever. In the December 2013 debate sponsored by the Canadian International Center uh, between Colin Robertson and Roland Paris of the University of Ottawa, Professor Paris challenged Mr. Robertson's assertion that the Harper government's foreign policy was ideologically based. Quote, I think ideologically based almost gives too much credit to what is essentially a fairly incoherent foreign policy, Professor Paris rebutted, asserting that the Conservatives' foreign policy has been characterized more by drift and neglect than by anything else. I think both men are partly right. Looking back, as we are doing tonight, it is possible to discern an ideologically consistent set of principles that had animated the Harper government's foreign policy from its earliest days. But in the first half of the Harper decade, as Paul Wells calls it, it this policy was marked by flawed thinking, imperfect execution, and events, dear boys, event, dear boy, events. The result was a period of conservative policy incoherence. Foreign affairs, especially in the early days of the Harper decade, was largely run out of the Prime Minister's office, which viewed the bureaucrats in the department itself with deep suspicion. After all, they had implemented for decades a foreign policy that the Conservatives sought to reverse. Fort Pearson's marching orders were clear. Do nothing without clearance from the centre. Do not expect clearance from the centre. Beyond that, the first Harper government was a weak minority that could fall any day, implementing the domestic agenda, agenda on tax cuts, law and order legislation, accountability legislation, that was the top priority. Nonetheless, if the Harper government didn't actually have a foreign policy as such, it took a series of actions related to foreign affairs. And looking back, I think we can determine a set of principles that guided those actions. And the first principle is the most important, the one that I've already raised. Conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the Conservative coalition. There are few Quebec voters within the conser Conservative coalition, and so Conservative foreign policy paid little attention to Quebecers' suspicions of foreign entanglements and the American hegemon. In fact, in the early days, Conservative foreign policy was about nothing but foreign entanglements and getting closer to the United States. The Laurentian downtowns were not in the Conservative coalition. So the Conservatives paid little attention to the Laurentian obsession with promoting Canadian values through multilateral forums. Instead, the Conservatives would promote Canadian interests through whatever forums could advance those interests. Immigrants, however, were very much a part of the Conservative coalition. So were rural folk. So were prairie folk. And many of them took a very dim view of China. For many in the Conservative voting coalition, and many inside the government caucus, the previous liberal obsession of wooing Chinese businesses with, while ignoring the communist regime's flagrant biz, uh, rights violations represented the worst form of opportunistic pandering, and Stephen Harper agreed. He said, I don't think Canadians want us to sell out important Canadian values in 2006 when he was at the APEC forum. They don't want us to sell that out to the almighty dollar. Just to make sure the Chinese received the message, the Prime Minister met the Dalai Lama in his office with a Tibetan flag on his desk, which a spokesman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry described as, quote, disgusting conduct. The Taiwanese representation in Ottawa was honored with similarly favorable treatment. The Chinese seethed. But the government's assumption that Canadian businesses could pursue opportunities in China, even as the Canadian government snubbed the regime in Beijing, turned out to be flawed. 
Business leaders warned that Ottawa and Canada were being frozen out of the Chinese market. Trade from China with China declined relative to the United States and Australia, major competitors of ours in trade with, uh, with China. As Paul Evans of the University of British Columbia wrote, Canada had put itself into a category of one. As almost every other government in the world was approaching engagement with the fervor and techniques the Harper government was abandoning. I'm grateful to Professor Evans for sharing with me the page proofs of his forthcoming book, Engaging China, Myth, Aspirations, and Strategy in Canadian Policy from Trudeau to Harper. It's a good read. Word also began filtering up from the suburban shires. While the first wave of Chinese immigrants to Canada had come from Hong Kong, and there was no love lost between them and the regime in Beijing, more recent Chinese immigrants came from the mainland and did not appreciate China bashing. Those Chinese immigrants, voters lived in the suburban ridings that the, that the Tories so coveted. Stephen Harper's cold shoulder to China was putting his electoral fortunes at home at risk. By 2009, the Sino-Canadian relationship was a mess, and Stephen Harper was entirely to blame. Foreign policy reaches its apogee with war, and the Conservatives inherited one. When they came into, off, into office, the security situation in Kandahar was deteriorating by the day as the Taliban shocked Western forces with the tenacity and effectiveness of their resistance. In March, 2000, March 6, 2006, during an unannounced visit to Afghanistan, Harper declared, there will be some who want to cut and run, but cutting and running is not my way and it's not the conservative Canadian way. We don't make a commitment and then run away at the first sign of trouble. We don't and we will not as long, I'm, as long as I'm leading this country. The Conservatives accelerated a build of, of defense forces begun under Paul Martin. Defense spending increased by roughly a billion dollars each year. In 2001, defense represented 0.9% of GDP. By 2010, it had risen to 1.4%, essentially a 50% increase. And this commitment spoke to a second principle of conservative foreign policy. The Canadian military will be a source of pride, not embarrassment. And Canadians responded. Most visibly, they responded with the people who lined the roads and highways honoring the war dead, revealing, as one military commander observed, quote, that Canadians have finally taken ownership of their military. The Harper government also used the military as a tool for reimagining Canadian history the reintroduction of the word royal to the Air Force and Navy, the commemorations of Canada's martial past, the downplaying of peacekeeping in favor of peacemaking, all sought to dilute the Laurentian lens through which Canadians viewed their past, bringing into sharper focus a Canada that fought to preserve its freedom and values wherever they were threatened. But there is myth, and then there is boots on the ground. Even with 2,000 troops in Afghanistan, the largest Canadian deployment overseas since the Korean War, resources did not begin to meet demand. In 2007, the Prime Minister commissioned a panel led by John Manley to assess the situation in Afghanistan. Manley's task force recommended an additional battalion for Kandahar province. Retired General Andrew Leslie, who was chief of the land staff at the time, told Paul, uh, told, later told Paul Wells, whoever told John Manley that a battalion was needed should be taken out and spanked. It would take at least three brigades to assert any real control over Kandahar, which is what the Americans sent in when they took over in 2010. Until the Americans relieved them, the Canadians barely hung on in Kandahar as the death toll climbed above 150. The Conservatives' military buildup was about more than Afghanistan. The Canada First Defence Strategy, released in 2008, envisioned a fleet of Arctic patrol vessels and a deep water port at Nanasivik in support of aggressive Canadian claims over Arctic lands, water, and seabed. Such claims and plan, uh, plans marked a sharp distinction from the liberal approach to Arctic issues, which was to claim everything and do nothing. The new conservative Arctic assertiveness stemmed from more than a robust determination to defend Canadian interests in the far north. Conservatives have always chased at how the many Canadian symbols and values, the national flag, peacekeeping, the welfare state, the CBC, are all identified with the Liberal Party. The Conservatives were anxious to establish new myths, ones that Canadians would associate with the Conservative Party and Conservative values, and that's why they chose the North. Stephen Harper's love affair with the Arctic, and I can assure you from personal experience that his annual trips up there in the summer are the closest thing he ever gets to acting like a little kid, 
highlights the third Canadian foreign policy principle, one very much related to the second. Canadian foreign policy shall bolster patriotic pride. Bullish conservative assertions over sovereignty over not only Arctic lands, but water, seabed, and now Santa's workshop is probably the most visible manifestation of that policy. But the economic crisis of 2008 threw conservative procurement plans into the trash bin. Plans for an icebreaker, for the patrol ships, for the deep water port, they're all on paper and nothing else. And as the Russians massively deployed their military into their north in assertion of their claims, and the Chinese started turning out icebreakers that Canada could only dream of, our commitment to double down on Arctic sovereignty looked more and more like a bad bet. The Conservatives did work cooperatively with the Arctic Council, which represents those nations with territory in the far northern hemisphere, on environmental protection, search and rescue, other issues such as that. But in other forums, especially at the United Nations, the Canadian commitment waned under the Harper Conservatives, and deliberately so, because there is a fourth principle to the Harper government's foreign policy, and that is, Canada will contribute to multilateral institutions to the extent they advance Canadian interests. Conservatives, both large and small C, see institutions such as the UN, the Commonwealth, La Francophonie, and other talking shops as just that, places with far too much talking and far too little doing. The UN is particularly suspicious in the eyes of conservatives. They think it focuses far too little on genuine threats to global security and far too much on bashing Israel. Stephen Harper, who is diffident, even shy by nature, and who started out with very little experience in foreign affairs, traveled reluctantly, and often returned from his summits complaining that little had been accomplished for the amount of sleep he'd lost. This led to the greatest foreign policy embarrassment of the Harper decade, the failure of Canada's bid for one of the temporary seats at the Security Council. That failure was the product of two conservative impulses in conflict, suspicion of the UN versus patriotic pride. Because of the suspicion, the government initially showed very little interest in bidding for one of the security seats that became available in 2010. But a seat in the Security Council confers prestige internationally, which would bolster Canadian patriotic pride. So as the date for the vote approached, new orders came from the center, get us that seat. But by then it was far too little, far too late. We lost to Portugal. It was not a good day. A core domestic conservative priority animates the fifth and final, at least for this survey, conservative foreign policy priority. Trade, trumps, everything. The conservative agenda is dedicated to protecting workers and consumers, as the conservatives understand workers and consumers. All conservative policy is economic policy, and all economic policy is aimed at protecting jobs and spending power. And so, the government is very bullish on trade agreements. We all remember when David Emerson crossed the floor from being the one-time liberal minister of industry to the new minister of international trade under the conservatives. His first task, which he accomplished, was putting a, a, finding a solution to the softwood lumber dispute, an irritant which had been nagging Canada-US relations for years, and by the way, boring the reporters who covered the thing to death. The Harper government was determined to address irritants between the two countries, and when Barack Obama became president of the United States, at their first meeting, Stephen Harper urged them to work together on creating a continental border security and trade agreement, which they got to work on. Settling the lumber dispute was really just sort of a down payment on that agreement. Mr. Emerson also launched an impatient drive to reorient trade negotiations. For more than a decade, liberal governments have been reluctant to engage in bilateral trade talks because they believe that Canada should be supporting the dole round of, mul of multilateral talks under the WTO. They defend their reluctance to engage bilaterally because, they said, of their commitment to DOA. But DOA died over the issue of agricultural subsidies, with Canada helping to actually hold the knife. And so Mr. Emerson pushed for bilateral trade agreements. Jordan came first, followed by European countries outside the EU, then Peru, Panama, Honduras, and Colombia. But the trade initiative also foundered. Congress implemented protectionist measures and that uh, made it difficult for Canadian firms to procure or bid for procurement contracts. And the Secur Homeland Security Department, in its unrelenting efforts to make it harder to get into the United States, further thickened the border. The, de the decision to require passports for Canadians and Americans entering each other's country was particularly damaging. And of course, the Great Recession of 2009 revealed how the dangerous weaknesses in the American economy it made it wise to wonder whether Canada should have so many eggs in that trading relationship basket. 
Beyond the 49th parallel, Canada's trade policy descended into the worst example of incoherence imaginable. In 2006, a consortium, a consortium of Pacific nations began talks aimed at a new kind of trade agreement that went past tariffs to include things like government procurement, financial services, intellectual property, even agricultural subsidies. Canada declined an invitation to join these talks, refusing even to discuss dismantling protections on the dairy and, and poultry industries known as supply management. But then the United States joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP as everyone calls it, and suddenly the Harper government wanted in. Sorry came the word, too late. So what does it all add up to? Five conservative foreign policy principles, each of which has been undermined. Conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the conservative coalition, but that led, among other things, to tension and anger in Canada's relationship with China. Canada's military will be a source of pride, not embarrassment, but despite an impressive buildup of personnel and equipment, it became clear that Canada could barely hang on in Kandahar. Canadian foreign policy shall bolster patriotic pride, but when the Conservatives proved unable to back up their commitments and claims in the far north, patriotic pride began to look more like simple bluster. Canada will contribute to multilateral institutions to the extent they advance Canadian interests, but that led to humiliation when Canada tried and failed to obtain a seat at the Security Council. And trade trumps everything, except for cows and chickens. So we can understand Professor Paris's assertion that conservative foreign policy, at least in the early years of the life of this government, was more than anything else incoherent. That incoherence reached its humiliating apogee in Kyoto. The conservatives inherited an impossible situation on the Kyoto Protocol to combat global warming. The targets agreed to by the Krechen government simply could not be reached. But global warming was a top of mind issue for voters back in 2006, and so the Conservatives tried to come up with some kind of policy. The, the initial effort was so badly botched that it cost uh, Rona Ambrose, the, uh, the Environment Minister, her job. The global economic crisis sank the environment as an issue among Canadian voters, and when the Liberals decided to run on the environment nonetheless, the Conservatives happily waged an election on economy versus environment, and you know who won. When Barack Obama became president, Stephen Harper promised to work with the United States on a cap and trade system to reduce industrial emissions across the continent. But when it became clear that Congress had no intention of passing a cap and trade bill, the Conservatives shrugged and withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol completely. It was the first time in our nation's history that Canada reneged on an international agreement. It was another very bad day. Canada's cavalier dismissal of the need for emphatic action on climate change, its formal withdrawal from the Kyoto Protocol, harmed energy export opportunities. Its casual assumptions that the Americans would approve the Keystone XL pipeline as a no-brainer, as the Prime Minister called it, failed to consider the power of the environmental lobby in the United States. Labeling opponents of the Pacific Gateway Pipeline foreign radicals only stiffened resistance to the pipeline at home. In every intersection of the environment, energy, and the economy, the Conservatives messed up. No wonder there are so many critics of the Harper government's foreign policy, some of them among the most distinguished voices in our nation, including former diplomat and current CG distinguished fellow Paul Heinbecker, former diplomat and prime ministerial advisor Robert Fowler, and former prime minister and foreign affairs minister Joe Clark. In Why We Lead, Canada in a Century of Change, Mr. Clark warned that under the Conservatives, quote, this outward reaching country could gradually turn inward and in the process depreciate national and personal assets that will become more valuable in the world that is taking shape than they ever have been before. If we ended the story here, it would not be much of a story. Conservative incoherence replaces Laurentian incoherence as Canada's standing in the world continues its long and relentless decline. But that is not the whole story. Far from it. For in the second half of the Harper decade, Canadian foreign policy has started to show both coherence and competence. The government has adjusted its five conservative principles, respecting the conservative coalition, rebuilding a robust military, fostering a sense of patriotic pride, assessing multilateral forums on how well they serve Canadian interests, and putting trade above all, and have adapted them to, uh, to, uh, uh, adapted them to fit a fluid reality. The government has learned. It has learned to the point where I believe we can now say we are in a period of conservative coherence 
as far as foreign policy is concerned. One sure sign of a weak and confused ministry is a steady rotation of ministers through it. Between 2000 and 2011, foreign affairs went through Lloyd Axworthy, John Manley, Bill Graham, Pierre Pettigrew, Peter McKay, Maxine Bernier, David Emerson, Lawrence Cannon, and John Baird. Nine ministers in 11 years. But Mr. Baird has broken the curse. He both shares the worldview of the prime minister and has his full confidence. John Baird is likely to become the first, full, first foreign minister to serve out a full four-year majority government term, the first one since Joe Clark under Brian Mulroney. Recognizing that he had been wrong on China, Mr. Harper traveled to Beijing in 2009. As they stood together in the Great Hall of the People, Premier Wen Xiaobao publicly humiliated the prime minister, saying it had been five years since the Canadian prime minister had come to China. Quote, five years is too long a time for China-Canada relations, and that's why there are comments in the media that your visit was one that should have taken place earlier, the prime minister scolded. Miraculously, the next day, the Chinese media was filled with stories criticizing the Canadian prime minister for taking so long to come to China. It's almost as though the premier knew what was going to be in the next day's newspapers. <laughs> But Mr. Harper endured the flogging and went back to China last year. The two countries have signed a foreign investment protection agreement. The government approved the takeover of the Canadian energy firm Nexon by the Chinese state-owned firm Sinoc, while warning that future acquisitions by state-owned enterprises were likely to be rejected unless the offer was really good. <laughs> Best of all, they sent us pandas. Quote, in many respects, the high policy of engagement was back where the Martin government had left it in 2005, Professor Evans concluded. Though balancing engagement with China and hostility towards the regime among the conservative base will always be a delicate balancing act. The army is steadily withdrawing from Afghanistan. We have avoided more recent potential quagmires. Canada limited itself to airstrikes in Libya, offered the French only logistical support in Mali, and quickly and emphatically rejected a UN suggestion that Canada might take over leadership of the UN peacekeeping force in Congo. And they have expressed deep skepticism over the makeup of rebel forces in Syria. But even as it withdraws from operations overseas, Kenyan military has shown itself remarkably nimble in responding to the humanitarian crises. But one of the smartest things the Harper government ever did in its early days was to overrule the recommendations of the military and to acquire four Boeing C-17 Globemasters, which provide heavy lift capability. This made it possible to dispatch the disaster assistance response team on a moment's notice. The swift and effective Canadian response to the earthquake in Haiti and to Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines last year stand in happy contrast to the Liberals' hapless handling of the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 when DART sat on the runway for weeks while the government searched for a way to get them off the ground. Although the Conservatives have promised more than they delivered in the Arctic, they have started to deliver, most notably in the construction of an all-weather road to the Arctic coast, a commitment that has been promised to the, Ar to, to the territories for decades but that the Conservatives finally delivered on. And a new defense strategy due later this year is expected to ramp down Canada's participation in expeditionary forces and ramp up its commitment to national defense with special attention paid to the far north. After early missteps, this government has pursued an intelligent and aggressive trade policy, signing a landmark agreement last year with the European Union, and finally, and at great cost, winning a seat at the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks. Bilateral free trade agreements are underway, negotiations are underway with India, Thailand, and Japan. Signature trading agreements could end up being the most significant accomplishment of this majority mandate. This multi-pronged outreach on trade is part of a policy that ties trade to development and foreign aid that has evolved over the years of conservative power. It reached its formal expression last autumn when the government released its Global Markets Action Plan, quickly dubbed it GMAP. In it, foreign policy, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs Trade and Development is ordered to, quote, entrench the concept of economic diplomacy as the driving force behind the government of Canada's activities through its international diplomatic network. Or, as one senior government official explained it to me, the message to the diplomats is, take off your tweed jacket, buy a business suit, land us a deal. Within the department, GMAP was greeted with a shrug because the reorientation to trade and economic development within foreign affairs was already largely in place. 
Economic diplomacy also lay behind the government's decision to dismantle the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA. While respected internationally, CEDA had a tendency to give a little money to a great many countries. The Tories tried to sharpen the focus initially, hence the anger in Africa when some countries had their funding cut there. But ultimately, they decided the development aid should be handled directly by foreign affairs, and foreign affairs should be doing nothing but trade. Stephen Harper is convinced that the best weapon against poverty is economic development. Henceforth, aid will follow and promote trade and economic development. But of course, the relationship with the United States is the one that matters above all. And here, the record has been mixed. Hopes for a continental border security agreement have been partially realized through the Beyond the Border Accord. The most encouraging progress is the final, well, please God let it be final, agreement to construct a new bridge between Windsor and Detroit, the busiest border crossing between the two countries. And you can now transfer your bags between American flights without having to recheck your luggage, and how cool is that? <laughs> that said, anger on the Canadian side over the uncertainty surrounding Keystone XL has cooled the relationship between Ottawa and Washington to a point where it may now require a new president and or a new prime minister to reset that relationship. Stephen Harper is now one of the longer serving global leaders and that personal experience on the world stage has led to a more clear headed approach to multilateral institutions. Diffidence has been replaced by confidence. Two examples. The G20 has emerged as the premier forum for global financial issues. The G8 is still a useful club for like-minded economies. The Harper government has been heavily involved in both, with Canada spearheading the maternal uh, health initiative in the, the G8 in 2010, and contributing heavily to the restructuring of global financial regulations under the G20. But the Commonwealth has become all talk and little action. The Francophonie, by the way, is even worse. The Prime Minister boycotted last year's meeting in Sri Lanka over that government's treatment of its Tamil minority. Tamil minority. The Conservatives may well cut funding to the Commonwealth Secretariat completely. In fact, I think they will. Many observers criticize the decision to stay away from Colombo as domestic pandering to this country's Tamils. But what government has ever conducted foreign policy without a careful eye on the political consequences among domestic constituencies? The only real difference is that the supporters and potential supporters of the Conservatives are being pandered to in a way they were never pandered to before by the other political parties. Say it with me. Conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the Conservative coalition. This debate of pandering versus principle is most fiercely joined on the question of Israel. Criticisms of the Conservatives' unwavering commitment to that government have been roundly, con uh, the, the Conservatives' unwavering commitment to that government has been roundly condemned. In a speech to the Liberal Policy Convention in 2010, Robert Fowler lacerated the Harper government for, quote, selling out our widely admired and long established reputation for fairness and justice in this most volatile and dangerous region of the world, unquote, for no other reason than, quote, to lock up the Jewish vote. Let's first be clear about one thing. Those who know Stephen Harper best, those who have known him since his youth, say that his intense interest in and support for Israel emerged when he was a teenager. It has never wavered. For him, Israel is a democratic Western state struggling survival for survival in a region of hostile and often unsavory regimes, and in a world where anti-Semitism remains rife. As Prime Minister, he has been determined from the first day to reorient Canadian foreign policy in favor of defending and supporting Israel. Whatever you think of his stance, it is highly principled. It has also won the gratitude of Jewish voters in Canada. Several ridings with large Jewish constituencies have switched from liberal to conservative in recent elections, in part because of the Harper government's strong support for Israel. So is the conservative stance on Israel principled policy or partisan pandering? The answer is yes. Sum it all up, and what do you have? A big break. A new emphasis on trade, a new belligerence in the North, a more robust military, encouraging a new patriotism, a new indifference, even hostility, towards at least some global institutions, a new and unqualified commitment to Israel. Most of all, a new determination to make Canada's policy more conservative, small and large C, in word and deed, in order to align that policy to the values and concerns of the Conservative coalition. It's quite a change. Some people think and hope that this break is really only a bump, that after the next election, the Liberals, either alone or in some combination with the NDP, will come to power, restoring a more balanced, 
multilateral Laurentian approach to Canada in the world. Perhaps. But bear one thing in mind. The West is only going to grow more populist and more politically powerful with each passing year. The flood of Chinese and Indian and Filipino and other Asian and Pacific immigrants will never abate. New Canadians are too powerful now electorally for any government to shut off the immigration tap. Rural Canada and its populations are in decline, but the suburbs where 67% of Canadians now live will only swell. Daryl Bricker and I wrote in The Big Shift that whatever political party wins the next election, or the one after that, or the one after that, must take this new reality into account. It must take the West into account. It must take the suburbs into account. It must take the immigrants into account. And if the West and the suburbs and the new immigrants actually like this new conservative foreign policy, then a different government, whatever its political stripe, will have to take that into account as well. In which case, the big break will no longer be seen as a break at all. We'll have a new term for it. We'll call it bipartisan. Thank you. Now, some of you might have something to say about all that. There's a microphone there, there's a microphone there, and I'm told, uh, there, and I'm told that because of the miracle of modern technology, people online are going to pose questions that will pop up on this screen magically. Um, so please, let's begin, let's start talking about it. Who wants to be first? <laughs> it gets easier, I know, as it goes along. I think you have to come down uh, to the first microphone. Uh, John, thank you. Can you tell us, is there a, since 2006, a new tension between the, the dip, diplomats and the politicians? Uh, are they at war with each other? Uh, What's going on? Are they cooperating? Uh, I get the sense in all the previous governments that the diplomats were running the foreign policy and now they've got very little say in it. I say that there was a war between uh, the, the political class and the diplomatic class. Uh, the diplomatic class lost the war. Um, at least they've lost the war for now. There may be future engagements. Um, as I said, it's absolutely true that the conservatives didn't like the bureaucracy at all when they came to power. Um, and they especially didn't like the bureaucracy. Actually, they liked the guys in finance just fine. But they didn't like the people in foreign affairs. They saw them as ersatz liberals. I would call them not liberals, Laurentians. And the reason I use the word, by the way, Laurentian, is because progressive conservative governments were every bit as Laurentian as liberal governments were. Um, and, uh, and so they essentially said, do nothing, uh, because anything that you do, we won't like. Nonetheless, they worked hard and they produced papers, they actually produced two different papers on China, both of which were rejected. Um, over time, because remember, by the time of the next election, the Conservatives will have been in power 10 years, and that's a long time to be in power. So as one Assistant Deputy Minister retires and a new Assistant Deputy Minister is, is, is uh, appointed, the ranks change. It would be safe to say that in foreign affairs, as in elsewhere, the, the senior ranks of the public service are now more in accord uh, with the values and priorities of the conservative government that serves them. Um, you don't get ahead unless you are. Um, obviously, if uh, the government has changed after the 2015 election, that process will reverse itself um, to the extent, however, that as uh, Daryl and I maintain, they are going to have to continue to uh, accommodate at least some of the values and the realities uh, of, of what the conservatives have done over the last 10 years. And if so, that will be the ultimate legacy at foreign affairs for this government, not just who they promoted. Yes. Thank you very much for the talk, John. Um, I just had a question to follow up on some of the comments you made about the Northern policy. Um, during your periods of incoherence, do you feel sometimes it speaks to a greater problem 
potentially systemically within those two ministries that work together on that policy. Not to negate that policymakers have a certain level of expertise that they need to exert, but also political leaders, the decision makers, can only make the decision, but they need to be advised by those experts and they need to present to them a coherent implementation of the decisions. Do you think there is a systemic problem on, at different levels below? Yes, the problem is systemic and it manifests itself though not just here and not just with the conservatives, it manifests itself everywhere. Uh, if you, uh, we were discussing this, if you um, talk to people in the State Department, uh, to people in Whitehall, to people at the uh, Quai d'Orsay, you hear the same thing over and over again. We're irrelevant now. No one listens to us. We have none of the influence we used to have. Because in the tw late 20th century and the early 21st century, foreign affairs is more and more run out of the office of the head of government. Here, the Langevin Bloc. Down there, the West Wing. 10 Downing Street. So the actual institutional department of, of foreign affairs or state department or anywhere else finds itself becoming increasingly marginalized as the, you know, the, the speed of communication and the speed of global crises um, push prime ministers and presidents to simply handle the matter themselves um, and to hire their, own appointed, uh, uh, hire their own appointed officials to advise them within the Privy Council office or within the prime minister's office directly. I think because of the suspicions between the, this government and the, the Foreign Affairs Department, that was exacerbated. But it was a trend that has been going on uh, for a very long time. I'll remind you all, for example, that my good friend Jeffrey Simpson uh, wrote a book in the late 1990s about Jean Chrétien called The Friendly Dictatorship. Uh, we have one uh, that's come from online. As Harper caters to his conservative coalition, should we be worried about the harm being done to other foreign relationship? As Palestine comes to mind. And certainly the criticism uh, of, of the Harper government's attitude towards Israel is that it has damaged our relations um, in the Middle East, that we have lost the uh, reputation that we had uh, as a, you know, a fair and balanced uh, friend of both sides, as a, as a sort of helpful interlocutor. I think, and this is my personal opinion, one that I would try to avoid as much as possible, um, the, in fact, we greatly exaggerate um, the extent to which we are valued in the Middle East as a helpful fixer uh, between those two sides. And in, on the ground, uh, in terms of trading relationships, in terms of foreign aid, in terms of uh, bilateral relationships between heads of government and foreign ministers, um, the relationship with the Arab states seems reasonably reasonable, uh, all things considered. John Baird is positively obsessed with the Middle East. He flies there constantly. He was just in Bahrain a few weeks ago, um, being criticized for not being sufficiently critical of the government in Bahrain. So I think in terms of our ability to influence the region, who cares, we never had any. In terms of our ability to work you know, diplomatic and more important economic uh, trade agreements uh, with the region, we seem to still be on good terms with the, uh, with the players that count. Um, but that said, if what you were concerned most about is how we are seen around the world in terms of our views in the Middle East, then damage has been done. David. Hi, John. Uh, thank you again for your talk. Um, I want to probe you on your central uh, thesis, which is that shifts in foreign policy are driven by domestic political shifts. And I raise the question of whether shifts in foreign policy are actually caused by shifts in international realities. For instance, the reason why Canada can't pursue its values agenda, the reason why it can't pursue multilateral institutions anymore is because the world stage has become more crowded as emerging markets have entered the stage. Um, and also in terms of trade, the reason why we've seen a shift in uh, trade uh, packs to the east is, be is because uh, the uh, natural resource boom in, in Canada has come at a time in which natural resource demand in the east has, has become. So I wouldn't wonder whether this is actually driven by international forces rather than domestic forces. Well, thank you. David and I are next to our neighbors, and he had promised me a much more confrontational question than that, so I'm quite disappointed. Um, I, I, I think the one and the other compliment are complementary. There is, 
an argument to be made that the liberal commitment to multilateral institutions like the UN was coming into conflict with the reality of, um, of, of emerging markets, uh, the rise of China, the reorientation of the economy, global economy after the, um, the, the, the crisis uh, of 2009. Um, that said, there remained somehow a certain fondness for it all um, in previous governments, a belief that we helped create these institutions, we should have something to do with them. Uh, and we should continue to try to foster them. But I think under either liberal or conservative governments, you would have seen the G8 diminishing in importance, the G20 increasing in importance. I think after 2009, any government would have realized that it has to be careful in how much it relies on the United States for trade and, the, and, and what infrastructure it needs to put in place on the Pacific to move natural uh, resource uh, products overseas and would have met the same resistance um, to, to those projects. So yes, I think international forces are driving shifts in the domestic agenda. It perhaps is easiest to say that the only difference is the liberals would have done it, the conservatives are doing it with enthusiasm. Yes. Uh, my name is Edwin Laye from Kitchener, Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, John, for your comments. I have uh, a question on something you said, and then uh, would like to ask you about uh, global security. You mentioned that the next government need to be uh, aware of a certain reality, and you included the suburbs and the new immigrants. And my question to you is, shouldn't that new government be aware of the growing power of developing countries. Because uh, in 2010, when Canada was turned down for the Security Council, there were some African countries that were very instrumental in voting Canada out of the Security Council seat. And as more developing countries become more powerful, I think the way Canada is proceeding with this foreign policy, which used to be poverty reduction, and now that it's based on economic reality, as good as it is for Canada, it's going to create some major problems in the relationship between some of these developing countries. So my question to you is, do you see that happening? And secondly, global security. I, as a Canadian, am quite worried about what is happening out there and the perception that we're giving in terms of lecturing and leaving in it, on the global stage. Do you see that as a worry that is worth thinking about? Uh, to answer the second question first, when Canada lectures on the global stage, it means nothing. Um, and therefore, it's slightly embarrassing when it does. Um, I applaud John Barrett, for example, in his uh, very principled uh, determination to point out uh, rights abuses against homosexuals in developing countries. Um, I wish it had some impact, uh, but, it, but it won't. So it, it makes us feel good when we uh, trumpet the rights of women, the rights of sexual minorities in developing countries. Um, and, and, but I don't think it actually has any influence in the agenda one way or another. Um, as to whether we are damaging our relations with developing countries as a result of uh, this policy, and that was reflected in the, in the consortium of countries that voted against us uh, in 2010 at the Security Council. What matters, I think, for the conservatives is not what they think. Again, it's not a values agenda, it's an interests agenda. So when Canada looks at Africa, it doesn't look at the projection of Canadian values into Africa. It looks at Africa and says, what are our interests in Africa? Where can we uh, profitably uh, deploy resources? So, for example, uh, this government is looking uh, carefully at Nigeria. It's an on-again, off-again relationship as the situation in Nigeria improves and then, uh, and then deteriorates. But it's clear that in the long haul, Canada wants to foster, under this government, long-term strong relations with Nigeria because Nigeria is a growing emerging economy with tremendous economic potential. And it will look around the planet at that. It, if Vietnam is a place for Canadian products, where, uh, where, Cana where Canadians can sell things, we're, we want to be in Vietnam. If Cambodia isn't yet able to uh, offer us any kind of serious markets, we won't be serious about Cambodia. 
It won't be whether we need to foster democratic development more in Cambodia or in Vietnam. It will be whether, in fact, it's in our interest to devote resources to Vietnam and or Cambodia. Uh, the Globe had a good story a few days ago about um, the, the Canada organizing a new set of um, priorities for nations, where we were going to have um, our, our major resources uh, directed in the coming years in Asia. But one of the countries was redacted. So we don't know what the fifth country in Asia is, but we're pretty certain it's Burma. Because as that country moves out of the dictatorship and as its economy begins to expand, it's in our interest to be in Burma, not just to help them with you know, developing policing or judiciary or whatever it is, more important, to help them develop the ability to buy things from Canada. So I think they will, in terms of, so the word global means nothing to the conservatives. Interests here and here and here are, what mean, are all that matter for the conservatives. Uh, we have one more online. The conservative coalition focuses on Asian immigrants plus the West. However, there is no regional focus on Asia in Harper's foreign policy. How come? I think that's um, part of the, 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 the evolution from incoherence to coherence. Again, and I didn't touch on it in the speech because you know, time is limited. In the early years, um, the conservatives uh, thought that Latin America would be a great place to, uh, to place a lot of interest. I named the, the Latin American countries that um, we, uh, we signed free trade agreements with. And there was just a general lack of interest in what was going on in the Far East, a lack of interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks when you could have gotten in on the ground floor. And a general feeling in, in Asia Pacific that uh, we, you know, all we wanted to import was their immigrants. And um, that is in the process of changing. Partly it turned out that Latin America wasn't as promising as, as it could have been. Uh, they're, no, they're just not as a consortium interested in signing trade agreements with us. Interestingly, in terms of the values agenda, it's almost like Israel. One thing that Stephen Harper did to damage the relationship with Latin America, and he knew what he was doing it, and he couldn't care less, uh, was when he opposed, I've forgotten the forum, um, but it was, uh, it was in uh, 2012, and it was in Cartagena, I believe. Uh, Latin American countries, the United States and Canada, were debating um, whether to d offer greater recognition of Argentina's claims to the Falkland Islands. And Barack Obama was inclining towards uh, a more neutral stand than the United States had been in the past. And Harper was livid that, um, that the Falkland Islands uh, uh, was entitled to determine its own destiny and that we must not sell out the interests of the people on those islands, uh, the right to a democratic self-determination, to pandering to Argentina. And he convinced um, uh, Obama to veto the, uh, the resolution. Um, and Kuchner stormed out of the conference furious. And any hope we ever had of getting into any kind of trade agreement with Latin America that involves Argentina ended, or with the, with, with the South Americans generally, ended that day. So there was one case where values uh, trumped interests um, and proved that there are times when Harper would. I think, however, in the general recognition that Latin America is not as promising as it could be, um, and that Asia is more promising than they had first imagined, the conservatives are shifting. I think if TPP gets signed and, and Canada joins uh, on, uh, then that opens the door to a lot, because then we will, we will be part of the world's largest trading agreement um, and oriented firmly in the Pacific region. Um, that would be really the most significant sign of us being uh, back in, in Asia. Yes. I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Ibbotson, for your talk, very informative. Uh, my name's Chris Kinsinger. I'm a history student at the University of Waterloo. Uh, you spoke a lot about the coalition that propelled the Conservatives to power in 2006, and specifically the middle-class suburban voters within this coalition. Uh, since becoming leader of the Liberals, Justin Trudeau has made no secret of his ambition to woo such voters. My question is how effective you think he has been in this regard and to what extent these voters will impact his foreign policy once it's actually released. Thank you, great, great question. I've deliberately kept any discussion about domestic policy um, out of the talk because I wanted to A, look back at what the Harper government has done um, and, and B, focus on foreign affairs. 
um, which was never really a compelling electoral issue. It's interesting, for example, in the 2006 election, even though we were committing to Kandahar, even though we were in, entering into the most uh, contentious, bloody, costly commitment uh, in 50 years, there was not one question during the leaders' debate uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, it's just not, uh, the, the old axiom is that the Americans vote for a president on foreign policy and Canadians vote for a prime minister on domestic policy, and it certainly was true then. I think uh, but the, the question answers itself. Justin Trudeau realizes that if he is going to become prime minister, he has to detach elements of the conservative coalition from the conservative coalition. Um, in a really good day, um, and, and, the, and the Liberals do have serious and, and, and practical hopes of picking up a seat in Calgary. Uh, they might do uh, something in Edmonton. They might expand in Winnipeg. Uh, they, but uh, they're not going to detach the Western base of the Conservative coalition um, from the Conservatives, although they may do a bit better in the, in the Lower Mainland. Actually, at the last election, they could hardly do worse in the Lower Mainland. Um, but they must, they must win in the 905. Every election is won in the 905. You go find me an election, and I looked back to 1980 and couldn't see it, um, where the majority of voters in the nine, or the majority of ridings in the 905 were the same as the government. Look at Quebec. Quebec hasn't voted for a governing party since 1988. It's been 25 years since Quebec voted for a governing party. They're very happy to vote for the opposition. In fact, they get to choose the opposition as often as not. So there's a great deal of, of, of talk in the press, very Laurentian talk to my mind, that Justin Trudeau has to, to beat down the NDP vote um, in Quebec so that he can get a liberal presence in that province. And, and he will want to expand. Again, they can hardly be in shakier position than they are right now. They're basically down to the English writings of Montreal. So they have got to expand their base in Quebec. But they do not get to become government from, via Quebec. They only get to be opposition via Quebec. They get to be government via the 905. And that means winning over immigrant voters. And that means winning over aspirational middle class voters. And that is why Justin Trudeau talks about the middle class and nothing else. He needs to break the conservative coalition. And I think he might do it. Stephen Harper is going to be asking for his fourth mandate. There is only two prime ministers have had four consecutive mandates, Laurier and MacDonald. King never got four in a row. So it is a very hard thing to ask for a fourth consecutive mandate. The government is getting old. I've just described a very long arc of foreign policy because it's been around for a long time. And obviously the Senate expenses scandal is incredibly damaging. And there is no correlation between the fact of the Senate expenses scandal and the political damage that it's done. That's the worst thing for the Conservatives. If it were a big scandal, they could do a big thing and try to fix it. But you know, it's 90,000 bucks, and he paid it back. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is not people going to jail like, this, like, like the, the sponsorship program. And the fact that the public is enraged about that $90,000, and the RCMP may ch charge the former chief of staff of the prime minister, suggests that the voters are looking for something else. They're tired, they're getting angry, they're getting annoyed at the secretive, autocratic, authoritative, whatever it is, uh, government, and they want something else. And here is Justin Trudeau. He is young. He is fresh. The hair is fabulous. And <laughs> he's, he's got ideas. He just fired the entire Senate caucus, which was brilliant. Um, and, it's, it's, uh, and so you could see, easily see the Liberals winning the next election. Or the election could hinge on the, go back to the economy. And then it's harder for the Liberals, because the Liberals have this problem. And here's the problem for any Laurentian party right now, uh, whether it's the NDP or the Liberals, or even the progressive conservative wing of, of the conservative party, should they uh, dominate after Stephen Harper leaves. To win the Laurentian vote, you have to win the voters in Quebec, and you have to win the voters in suburban Ontario. How do you do that? Quebec is about to pass that utterly obnoxious charter that it essentially prohibits minorities from working in the public sector if they, are, uh, if they have strong religious convictions. How can you reconcile? What would happen if a government in, at Queen's Park introduced legislation that prohibited uh, you know, the, the hijab or the kippah or, the, or a Sikh um, kirpan for anyone working in any hospital, in any school, uh, anywhere in Ontario? That government would be run out of town. 
So how do you tailor a message that is attractive to Quebec voters and to immigrant voters in Ontario? How do you attract, uh, craft a message that is attractive to Quebec voters in a province that is incredibly in debt, deeply in decline, suffering for, uh, soon to suffer from, from population decline, already suffering from relative population decline, in economic decline, and therefore in need of more assistance, more programs, more transfers from the rest of the country to sustain the social programs that Quebec has, and then sell that to the middle-class immigrant voter in the 905, to the, to the person commuting in from Burlington every morning on the GO train. How do you convince both of those groups to vote for the same politician? This is what Daryl and I maintain is the essence of the contradiction within the, the Laurentian uh, argument. It is why, while in any given election is a crapshoot, over the long haul, the Conservative coalition, as I've defined it tonight, is natural, logical, coherent. It fits together nicely. Think, and then I'll finish. Think back into the last century. Liberals governed for very long swaths. And then every now and then, uh, they would get defeated, and the progressive conservatives would come to power. It happened very rarely, but it did happen. Why did it happen? Well, Quebec nationalist voters decided they were angry at some new federal aspirations of the Liberal Party. Um, and Western voters uh, were always conservative anyway, so they were voting conservative. And Ontario voters were just so tired of voting Liberal time after time after time that eventually they decided for, to make a switch. And you had John Diefenbaker surging with a huge majority government, or Brian Mulroney surging with a huge majority government. And it never lasted long and always ended very badly because the Conservative Electoral Coalition made no sense. When he met his caucus, the conservative prime, progressive Conservative Prime Minister looked at the Quebec nationalists, looked at the Western uh, Conservatives, looked at the MPs who got in by a fluke in Ontario, and wondered, oh, what am I going to do here? Well, the answer, what you're going to do here is lose the next election. Um, one, or, or the one after that, and it did. That's the problem for the Laurentian parties right now. When you look at the coalition of Quebec voters and Ontario suburban immigrant voters, you go, that coalition makes no sense. Their interests aren't the same. They might coalesce uh, and, and vote in uh, a Liberal or NDP government or coalition government, but fundamentally, they, are, they, are, they contradict each other, and it is very hard to govern with a contradictory caucus. Whereas those immigrant voters in the 905 look to the West, its values, its, its aspirations, its specific orientation, and go, that makes perfect sense to me. So it is natural for those groups to hear. And that's why we think in the life of this century, in any given election, the Conservative Party will have an advantage going in over uh, whatever progressive party is challenging them. I think, to be fair, we should, uh, we should do one more uh, from the ether, and, um, and then, uh, yes, then we better call it a night. Uh, how have Harper's policies changed Canada's relationship with Africa? Well, for the worse. Um, so one of the things that CETA did uh, when, it, when it was CETA uh, was, as I said in the speech, sort of give money to everybody. Not really enough to do much of anything anywhere. Um, we gave money to China. Uh, but enough to uh, at least be present. CETA had a, had a good brand overseas. Uh, it, and with the Conservatives, and, and, and even Paul Martin, to be fair, um, lamented that CETA was all over the map, really literally, um, and wanted to refocus it. The Conservatives did refocus it. They tried to find 25 core countries where CETA could do its thing, um, and that meant the uh, elimination of a number of African countries, um, and that meant a lot of resistance. Um, from those African countries and, and, com and complaints that we had gone missing. And then the second tranche was, well, we're just not going to do a CETA anymore, period. Um, and of course, while there's a, a lot of uh, interest in, in foreign development in, in, in the, you know, the Asia-Pacific region, in many African countries, there just isn't. Um, there isn't right now. There will, may well be later, but there isn't right now a, a, an opportunity to look at one of those sub-Saharan countries, especially, and say, we have the chance to do X, Y, and Z. Um, a, we don't, and B, the Chinese are already there anyway um, and doing it. So uh, there, it is not surprising that the relationship between Africa uh, uh, you know, as a continent and Canada as a country had deteriorated under the Harper uh, Conservatives more probably than any other region of the world. Listen, I want to thank you all. You've been a great crowd. Um,
I appreciate your being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. A few quick comments before we adjourn. First of all, I want to thank John Ibbotson for his lecture this evening, or rather, both of his lectures. Uh, if brevity is a soul of wit, his first lecture on the Harper Doctrine was very witty, lasting all of three minutes, since there is no such doctrine. Uh, the second surprise lecture that he delivered uh, on the big break uh, was uh, wonderfully engaging, obviously informed by deep experience as a journalist He's for the better part of three decades at the front lines of many of these shifts. And uh, as John, as you probably know, has interviewed and met with um, most or virtually all of the prime ministers he's talked about and, and the, uh, the leading bureaucrats and also the voters in every city across the country. Um, so that uh, real experience and knowledge shines through. And, uh, you know, it's almost, you know, a newspaper, I love newspapers, obviously, and, it's, uh, and they're filled with information and it takes a lot of people to put it together. But if a, a newspaper could talk, then this is kind of what it would be like. Uh, we really enjoyed it. So thank you again. An edited video of this evening's live webcast will be posted to the website and we'll also have a blog about this event where you can add your own comments. Our next two public events in the CG Auditorium are both in February. On Wednesday, February 12th, we welcome TV Paul to the CG stage to discuss Pakistan in the contemporary world. Dr. Paul comes to us from McGill University where he teaches international relations and he's written several books on the security of South Asia. On Thursday, February 13th, we present General Tom Lawson, Canada's Chief of Defence Staff. He'll be speaking on the state of the Canadian Armed Forces and its priorities. So be sure to register for our events newsletter for information on all of our upcoming lectures, including our CG Cinema series. And remember that John's book is on sale in the lobby and he'll be available there to chat with you now. Thank you again for coming tonight and have a safe journey home.